Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harish. I hope you had a good conference till now. Uh, this session is not just about observability or monitoring. So sorry, organizers. We're just talking about here uh, online tool in, we built for dealer partners in Capital One and the migration, the modernization, and the observability journey we had for the last seven years or so. A uh, brief introduction about myself. I have around 16 years of experience working in cloud computing and distributed applications. Currently working as a lead software engineer in Capital One. Uh, quick introduction about Capital One. It's, I think everybody knows, it's a bank holding company specializing in credit cards, order loans, and savings account. So as I said, uh, for some of the legal reasons, some of the slides and everything has been like subdued as per my legal department. But so as I said, the Capital One specializes in auto loans. So our dealer partners, they submit the auto loans for funding. Those loan applications, they get approved or declined, depending upon the Capital One rules and the policies. So we built an online tool for our dealer partners where they can log in and they can structure these loan applications. They can change the APR, they can change the sales price, and then they can see what best suits for their customers and they can offer those deals to the customers. Not only this, these tools also happen, also helps them to manage their employees. They can manage their credentials, they can edit their passwords, they can add or delete new employees, whatever they want to do. They can also use this as a self-service portal to update the settings or update their notification preferences. So it's kind of an online portal or self-service portal we built for our dealer partners. So this journey started way back in 2015, 2016, when we built this application as a monolithic application. Like way back without, this application was built without any modularity. So you have different components, different, app, different capabilities, different modules, all bundled inside one code base. So you can talk about the authorization and authentication, which helps the dealer user to authenticate, or a presentation layer, which accepts the HTTP request and sends back the response in the JSON. I have my DAO layer, which talks to the database. I have my integration layer, which talks to the downstream APIs. All of this, bundled inside one code base deployed as one application. Like seven years, you can imagine. There was no microservices, everything built in one code base. But we were in AWS. So we deployed everything as single application in AWS. So here what you see is the Route 53, which represents the domain name. So a dealer typing in dealerstools.capital1.com, the request comes and hits over there. Then we have a WAF layer in between which filters my request. So the responsibility of WAP, which is Web Application Firewall, is to filter the request that exploits your systems. So something like a SQL injection or cross-site scripting, if somebody is trying to attack or consume excessive resources in your system, the WAP will block all the requests. The request has been filtered. It goes to one of the classic load balancers, which then intercepts the request and sends it to one of the EC2 containers and all of these EC2s, sorry, I use EC2 containers, sorry, EC2s, not containers. Uh, EC2s, and all of these EC2s are running the same version of the code. This UI code then makes a XHR call to the backend, and then the backend call is also intercepted by a classic load balancer, and then it forwards the request to one of the EC2s which is running the backend code, and then they talk to microservices or the databases. As you can imagine, so these are just the bullet points, but I will go into detail about that. We were suffering multiple pain points or multiple issues with this architecture. To start off with, the slow speed of development. Imagine a developer creating a pull request and merging it. The whole code base needs to be built and deployed. And the whole, the whole set of JUnit test suits, like hundreds of them would be executed. And consider, like, if the build fails, then you have to wait all over again. Code ownership. So there are multiple teams working on the same code base, and there are products, features that want to enhance or add new, add new features. So one team 
changing can affect the other teams because again, there's no ownership. It's just one single code base. As I said, there's one code base and there's a single line code change can affect the rest of the services or rest of the application. So that means I have to regression test the entire application for a single line of change. The monothic application, since it was built way back, they are tightly coupled with the legacy technologies. Code coupling, we were able to manage the code coupling by segregating the services and defining our packages as per the team structure. But in the end, there were a, still a bit of spaghetti code in few of the places. Flexibility, consider a, we built that application in Java 8, and for three years, we were not able to migrate to Java 11. It's just that you need the coordination across 10 or 12 different teams just to migrate that. As I said, one single line or 100 lines, you, want the you have to redeploy the entire monolithic application. There is no way out. The infrastructure, so if the traffic increases, your site becomes very popular. That means that you scale up the entire, uh, entire application, which increases the cost on your infrastructure. How do we get rid of all these pain points and the issues? So 2018, early 2019, we divided this application <coughs> into separate layers or separate microservices. So we took the capabilities and divided it into different microservices. And I said, hey, one team, you take care of this microservices. You own this. This is your code base. This is your capability. And you, are the, you have complete autonomy to change or add any features onto that. Not only that, we introduced, we separated out our front end also layer into multiple micro front ends, and each micro front end is served by a BFF. This BFF is not best friend forever, but this is back end for front end. The sole responsibility of BFF layer is to serve the UI. It serves as a orchestration and transformation layer, so consider it a request comes from UI, it orchestrates it to different microservices, collect the response, and send back the data as needed by the UI. So which means that each BFF is tightly coupled to win UI, the code base is small, that means my teams have less code to handle and they are responsible for just one code base. Not only that, the microservices, we said, you push your business events down to the data warehouse through the Kafka stream so that if my business analysts want to analyze or do an analytics on that, they have the data housed to, to do that. So as I said, we, see, we saw some benefits. So we divided the code base into different microservices, and so which, which means a team can work on one of the features or one of the capabilities without worrying about the rest of the application. The code base was reduced. That means my cost of my development time is severely increased. As the load increases to one of the applications, now I can, don't have to scale up the entire application. I can just scale up that one particular microservice. And in case, if there's an issue in one of the microservices, I can just isolate that failure without worrying about or without affecting the rest of the app. As I said, so since my one code base is now reduced into n different code bases, it was very easy to manage and easy to understand. Some of the architecture principles we followed along the lines, which we gathered like over the past when we are doing the development is, have the BFF coupled to one UI. If you have multiple UIs, let them talk to multiple BFFs. That makes the code base smaller, easier to understand, and easier for one team to manage. Going by the single responsibility principle and the microservices, each microservices, each capability handled by one team, just one team, and you are doing that job pretty well. It encapsulates its own data. And the very important point there is that each microservice should offer a well-defined interface. And the BFFs then talk to these microservices using this well-defined interface. So if microservices are doing a breaking change, they have to create a new major version. And that means that the BFF cannot automatically, automatically migrate to that major version and break the entire application. They have to pass a specified header to migrate to a major version. But if microservices are making a minor version change, for example, just adding a new field which is not required by the BFF, the BFFs can automatically migrate to that minor version. We have talked about architecture and the development practices. Yeah. So 
that depends on your capabilities. That is like endpoints is, you talk to your product, you have the capabilities, you do the whole event grooming. So I'm just like narrating the whole six years into like 40 minutes, but the whole thing is you do the capabilities, you do the event grooming, you talk to the product, and after the event grooming, you get the definition of microservices. So if you have similar capabilities, you put them into one microservices, so there's no limit to the number of endpoints as such, where I can say one or 10. It all depends on the domain model because it's all driven by, again, by domain-driven principles. So we have talked about the code flow, the, the architecture, and the development practices, but what about the infrastructure? We were using EC2s, which were necessarily VMs, and the VMs work pretty well for monolithic applications because you are all encapsulated in like one operating system. It works pretty well. But the VMs are pretty heavyweight, and they're slow to start. So how do we fix that problem? You enter the container world. But before I go into how the deployment pipeline looks like for a container, I'll just walk through, like take one minute to go through the pipeline, how the containers are built. So it all starts with the developer pushing the code to the GitHub, and the Jenkins pipeline will look for the webhook, will trigger the pipeline, will compile and build the code and create a Docker image out of that. And the Docker image will be pushed into a container registry. We, as I said, use AWS. So everywhere it was AWS services. We use ECS to launch our containers. The ECS then uses Docker, this Docker images to launch the containers. In ECS, we use something called as a TD file or task definition to define like what the container should look like, which Docker image and which version I have to use, what is my memory and CPU I need, how, what is the launch type, whether you want to launch it in EC2 mode or Fargate. We have not gone to Fargate, but that's a server, serverless offering from AWS. And if the network configuration you want to use, once you have defined and launched your containers, then you define your auto-scaling policies, and the Amazon ECS maintains your auto-scaling policies and bring the container comp count up and down. It suggested that you don't use one task definition for your entire application. We divide it into multi different microservices and different BFFs, and we have a separate task definition for each of our components. The deployment view is pretty much on the Route 53 and RAW was pretty much the same as the monolithic, so they were pretty much doing the same thing. But the major change was instead of the classic load balancer, we introduced the application load balancer now. The job of the application load balancer was to intercept the request, look at the context path, and then forward it to one of the containers. So I have a container running for authorization. I have a container running for managing my applications. So slash applications will go to application containers, slash authentication will go to authentication. So if now I have more users coming in to manage my applications, then I can just scale up that container. I don't have to scale up my entire app. Once it goes past the web ALB, it goes to one of the containers onto the web cluster, and then it goes, the XHR calls are based to an application load balancer, and then it talks to one of the containers on the backend side. Again, on the backend, it was, again, the whole context path. You intercept that. So we can configure the listener rules inside the application load balancers. It listens to that context path, and then forwards it to one of the containers. And they were pretty much talking to the same microservice in the database as they were doing earlier. Some of the benefits we saw is with containers, you can create isolated and consistent environment. So you can have a single EC2 running 10 containers, and these containers running the apps, they're totally isolated with each other. They're not going to affect each other. With containers, the speed to development is highly increased. You can make changes in the product, create new versions of images, and launch new containers out of that. Portability, that's the major benefit of containers. Whatever you need to run your application is all encapsulated inside one container. So that means you can easily shuttle the containers between different environments. Containers are self-contained and portable and small. That makes it the best fit for the microservices architecture. Again, with containers, if you have like a, a web a cyber vulnerability or something, you can easily patch, the, patch the, the same image and you can launch new containers out of that. And the last benefit is with containers, you can segment your APIs 
into different processes. And these different processes can talk to each other via REST API REST interfaces. So that means I could have 10 teams, five working on BFS, five working on microservices, and they can collaborate with each other to the interfaces. So one team says, hey, this is the interface. You need to send this request in this format, and I will send you the response in this format. I've defined the interface. Now you two work each other. I'm done. Uh, I won't spend much time on this one, but this was last year, 2021, when we moved from the modern architecture as per what the enterprise guideline is, but we moved from the microservices to modern. Some of the things were changed, but I will just point out the differences. We introduced a CDN, which is content delivery network, and we use Amazon CloudFront for that. Anybody aware of CDN? Anybody used it? So with CDN, you can configure different origins and different behaviors. So the way it works is you can say in CloudFront that if your request comes for your static assets, like S3, or sorry, like HTML or JavaScript, anything, it goes to your S3 bucket. So we moved away from deployment, deploying our front-end code into containers to S3. And then the back-end code, the BFFs, we all moved behind a gateway, an API gateway, just for better security. So that in the cloud front or in the CDN, we will say, hey, this is a request for dynamic content. Go to the BFF and get the dynamic content. If it's a request for a static asset, go to S3. So which makes it more secure, because if somebody is just trying to access the static asset, it doesn't have to enter the capital network. We can just get it from the S3, S3 bucket itself. The major change we did was we upgraded our client code and the web code to use the OIDC and auth flow. I could have a two hour separate session just for OpenID Connect and auth flow, but just in the interest of time, that's what we did actually, that the entire authentication was done through OIDC and auth. Why it was done? Why did we migrate it from the microservices to this? Just for better security and performance. The Amazon CloudFront comes with AWS Shield inbuilt, which is again an AWS service, and it provides high resistance to the DDoX and the other attacks. As I said, we move the BFFs, all the BFFs behind the gateway. That makes us a single way to register and secure and audit all our APIs. As I said, we migrated to the OAuth and the OIDC flow. That helps us that for different personas, like our internal users or dealer users, now I can authenticate using different IDPs. So I can have dealer user get authenticated with a different identity provider, and I can use my single sign-on for my internal users because that, that gives me the flexibility to do that. Not only that, if I have to swap one identity provider with other, I can do that too. So these were some of the benefits we got, and this is right now the, what is the current running work version in production. We were slowly trying to move from EC, like managing our containers from EC2 to Fargate so that we can go to the service mode. Okay, now coming back to New Relic and observability now because this is the New Relic conference. So we have talked about the disadvantages of the microservices architecture and, sorry, disadvantages of the monolithic architecture we faced. But by show of hands, how many of you got call in the night that, hey, the application is down or the performance is not good? Anybody? If only one, I think you're a lucky group of people. Then, <laughs> if you're not get a call. But yes, we used to get the calls in the night saying that, hey, I'm not able to authenticate, and then the dealerships are across various time zones. So if I'm sitting in Dallas and, and so I get a call at 10, 11 o'clock in the night because somebody's working in Pacific time zone at 9 o'clock, that, hey, I'm not able to authenticate or my performance is down. And then we started figuring it out. I was like, before they call us, how I could, I know that, that my application is down. Because it's my application, I should know that. I, sh I should be able to observe and monitor my application. But how do I make my application observable? Like, what is observability? So observability is the process of collecting and visualizing and applying intelligence to your monitors, logs, events, and traces to understand how your software system is doing. In today's world, every software or hardware is emitting records of every activity, whatever is happening. So the goal of the observability 
is to get that metrics, get that data, get that activity, and just analyze that. If there's an issue, detect it, resolve it before it impacts the end users or end the customers, and let them make the customers happy. So in the end, I will put a disclaimer. It's, not about, it's all about customers. You have to look at it from the end user experience of what is your customer doing, actually. There are five most important components of observability. Those are metrics, logging, alerting, visualizing, and tracing. So what do we do? So the metrics you have to collect is emitted. It has to be emitted and collected at various layers. We are running your software or you're bearing your infrastructure. Application and infrastructure logs also should be parsed and rich, and it should be stored in a central place for query and analytics. Those logs, the stacks then should be instrumented, and that's what we use New Relic for is, should be instrumented with an APM tool like New Relic to emit the tracing data. All the logs that you have stored, you should be able to analyze and visualize that using queries. And then, whatever the logs you have collected, they should be integrated with a alerting system like PagerDuty so that you can do predictive alerting. When we started this journey of observability, there were many questions asked because the business, they were aware of, they heard the term like monitoring. So they asked, hey, is monitoring same as observability? It is, they have some similarities, but they are different. The observability is to gain insights onto the internal working of your system by analyzing the external output. As I was saying, they are emitting metrics, they are recording activity. You are analyzing those records and the activity to see how your internal system is working. And with observability, the main goal is you should be able to detect the problem faster and resolve it. Monitoring does the same thing. Monitoring collects the logs and events and traces from different systems and then sends you an alarm in case of the failure. So the similarity is, yes, they are, they are collecting the logs, they are collecting the events, the traces, and storing it at one place, and then detecting and alarming you in the case of any failures. But the major difference is the objective. When monitoring, you will, they will be able to detect that there's a problem and send you alarm, while observability will go one step ahead, saying there's a problem, and this is the reason there's a problem. And then you have to that you will be able to identify the root cause and resolve that issue. So consider basically a device which is not working. A monitoring will tell you, hey, this device is not working and there is an alarm for that. But with observability, it will tell you what caused the device not to work. So what are the, some of the benefits we saw using the observability is the application performance monitoring. The first one, a full end-to-end -end observable solution will make the developer's life pretty easy. He will be able to pinpoint the issue, he will be able to detect the issue, and he will be able to resolve the issues much faster. Not only that, your SRD team and the DevOps team can use this full end-to-end -end observable solutions to make your systems more secure and resilient. You have an infrastructure and ops team, they can use this observable solution to increase your uptime and performance and reduce the time it takes to pinpoint an issue. The fourth one is the most important. That's why we are actually building the end user is before this issue impacts the end user, you have to resolve the issue so that you can make the customers happy. And the last is with this observability tooling or observability solutions, your teams can collaborate and work with each other and resolve the issues faster. I wanted to put up this slide. This is not regarding any tools or any technologies. These are the Google principles. This is brought up by Google, and this is what Google follows. Google says, you monitor these four golden signals, and you're good. You'll be able to monitor the health and the performance of your systems. So the first of the signal is latency, the time it takes to serve a request. And according to Google, both the requests, whether it's successful request or the failed request, they suffer the latency. So it's very important to put a monitor, a target for your latency rate, and then monitor the successful and the failed requests. The, th the second thing is the traffic, the number of visits on your website, or how popular your, tra how popular your website is, actually. So, but the traffic depends on the type of the application. So if you are running a web service or an HTTP application, then this is the HTTP request. But if you are, if you are actually trying to do a, like a storage system, it would be the transactions per second. 
Third thing is the errors. You should monitor how many errors you're getting. And monitor could be, and errors could be of different sorts. You could have a 500 internal server error. You could have a 200 with an inaccurate content, which is again an error. And you could specify in your settings saying that if I get a 200 error within two seconds, then only it's a success. If I get in five seconds, it's a failure. Like, if my page loads takes 10 seconds, my, my user will just close the browser and go away. It's not gonna come back. Saturation is depending upon, saturation is how full your system is, or is it running at full capacity? So it generally refers to the memory and the CPU utilization, memory and the CPU utilization. So you should be able to, you should track that saturation so that you know that your systems are available actually. Most of the systems, they tend to underperform before it reaches before before 100%. So this is how our observative framework looks like. I talked about those five components. So if you look at the, on the left hand, I have my Java processes, I have my databases, I have my VMs, I have my Docker containers. They are pushing the events and the logs, and I'm storing it in one place. In our case, this short-term storage with time store was Prometheus, and we use Grafana for visualization. So the Grafana, we can just write query to analyze or to query this store, to do the, the metrics which is stored in Prometheus, and then I can visualize in Grafana. The, all this infrastructure and application, they're putting the logs, and I can use Plunk or Elk for my log aggregation, and again, I can query, analyze those logs. For tracing, we instrumented our application and the infrastructure stack with Neuralic, so it emits the tracing data. And then, this, we were using Alert Manager to integrate it with the injected metrics, and then using PagerDuty for alerting the all-call engineers, actually. So this is how we have set up our observability framework to observe our applications. This would be the last topic of the presentation. So I just want to cover what all different dimensions we went ahead and observed our applications. So these were the different dimensions we are right now monitoring or observing our applications. One is the site catalyst. Other is we are analyzing our business metrics and the tech metrics. I will go into the details of each of this one. I'm also looking for, like, I'm also using real user monitoring and synthetic monitoring. That's what we use Neuralic for, for the real using and the synthetic monitoring. We are actually visualizing the whole metrics in Grafana. We are using logging. We are using Splunk as well as Elk. We are, use, we are ingesting the metrics using the alert manager and using PagerDuty to alert the all call engineers. And then for distributed straighting, we are again using Neuralic. So these are the different spectrums where we are analyzing or visualizing or just compiling our metrics. So this is the entire stack. Let me go into, and I will just take a few basic definitions and the benefits of each of this. So what is website analytics or site analytics? It's the process of like collecting processing, and visualizing the internal and the external data about a website. So it covers everything. It will tell you where a user is coming from, what he is doing on your website, is he liking a content, and all those things. The success of a business depends upon strategy. Every business here, they develop a strategy, and then how, that's how they work on. But how do you identify the strategies working or not? How do you measure that? That is being done using a website analytic tool whether the strategy laid out the business is really working or not, actually. And if it's not working, they can get this data, they can collect this data, and they can find out which, where they should head or where they should steer so that it becomes more effective. Some of the benefits were, if you can measure your site traffic, the number of website visits on your web, the number of visits on your website. So for example, you have launched a new website and you're getting like 50 requests within a month, good. But if you're still getting 50 requests within a year, that's not good. So that means you have to revise your strategy. So it's not important just to track how many visits are there, but you have to also track how they're evolving, actually. The other thing is the bounce rate. If a user coming into your website and then without visiting the second page is falling, that hampers the productivity. So ideally, the bounce rate should be less than 30% for the better productivity. Over the time, as you are analyzing your website traffic, you will gain and get a lot of metrics then you can see what the trend is following 
and you can make optimization on your website, whether I need to change the navigation structure, whether I need to introduce any breadcrumbs, whether I need to restrict any URLs, and things like that. And again, depending upon that data, you can actually plan your marketing campaigns, like the future marketing campaigns, depending upon the data you have collected. Business metrics. That's very important. That's very important for your product. How my business is doing? Am I, am I generating even revenue? Am I getting much traffic, actually? So the business metrics is also called a key performance indicator. This creates a value that shows the progress of a company's business goal. There are various business metrics you can collect. Like it could be the lead conversion, it could be your revenue, it could be anything, but it all depends on the type of business. I'm not going to collect 100 different side metrics. I could, I could just collect, hey, are my dealers able to structure my application and how many, how many structuring they are doing actually. But that type of metrics doesn't hold good for Netflix or Amazon. They will be collecting the business metrics according to their business actually. Some of the benefits are, as I said, that you can, you can collect these metrics and analyze and see where do, you need to, where do you need to steer it and where do you need improvement. The business metrics also make sh and shows that your entire company is working towards that one single goal. Sometimes you have the legal and the compliance reasons which mandates that you have to track a certain business metrics. And with the help of these metrics, you'll be able to identify problems way ahead in the game before it becomes the major pain points. This is similar in the lines of business metrics. It's just that it's not aligned to product. It's what the tech teams care for. It's what basically you have your EC2 instances, you have your Docker instances, they are emitting metrics, and you are analyzing those metrics. So you transform that into a technical information, those metrics that tell you how reliable your systems are, how efficiently they are working. Again, in this case, you have hundreds of tech metrics, so you don't have to analyze each and everything. Some of the major things are like error rates, your garbage collection, your heap size, your CPU usage, your me memory utilization. And all of these things you can analyze and query to see, as the benefit I'm saying is, to improve the end user experience and increase the customer satisfaction. And since now you have data, you can prioritize your sprint stories and put in your backlog like what you want to fix, where do you want to put your efforts on actually, that's what becomes your more objective. And with the help of querying and analyzing these metrics, you can actually improve the productivity so that the developers can focus on writing the code for the products than trying to analyze in the logs like where my issue is actually. This is what we used New Relic for. Is it a real user monitoring, also called as a real user measurement? Real user monitoring is a monitoring practice that analyzes each and every transaction your user is doing on the website. So it's a kind of a passive monitoring as compared to a synthetic monitoring, which I will cover in the next slide. Synthetic monitoring is more of a proactive monitoring. This is more of a passive monitoring, which analyzes what your, the user is doing on the website. So the way it works is you put a JavaScript code on the top of the application, and that records the page loads as well as the XHR requests. So with the real user monitoring, since it's tracking each and every user transactions, you can see what your, user, what your user is facing. He's able to access each and every part of your application. If he's not, might be because of a network issue or backend issue or front-end issue or whatever it is, the, user, the real user monitoring will be able to trace that. So some of the benefits are you can resolve the front-end issues before it impacts the user. You can also measure the core web vitals. And if you look at the Neuralink dashboard, they tell you the core web vitals for a particular web, web page or a, web, web, or a particular web page URL. You can also pinpoint the issue to the exact JavaScript line of code. Also, as I said, you can analyze the product usage, the errors across a user session. And the last thing is, which is common for all these things are the developer productivity. With the help of these tools, you're able to figure out the issues faster and resolve it faster. Thus, your developers are pretty expensive guys, so they can spend the time working on the real products. This is what I was talking about. This is synthetic monitoring. This is more of an active monitoring where I am writing a script that is simulating a user path 
that a user might take while engaging an application. So the way it works is I write a script, a bot executes the script around a periodic intervals. It could be 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And that means that if my website is having certain issues or application is having certain problems, I would be get the alarm fast before it impacts the end users. You can write your script and run it across geographies and device, device or devices actually, and then you can track the data from across all US if you want. Since you have collected the data and it's running across every like 15, 20, or 30 minutes, you can use this data to baseline and benchmark your application. Also, the, the way synthetic monitoring works is it's working at the browser level where all your dynamic comp components are getting merged. You're getting the data from microservices, BFFs, everything falling into one place, which is the browser. So you're actually monitoring your website from end user level. This is a pretty interesting thing, the visualization. What is visualization? The visualization is just the graphical representation of the data. It's just getting your numbers in spreadsheets to a more of a line graph or bar graph. You, everybody would have heard the code is like, a picture is worth a thousand words, and that's what it is actually. So if you see a graph or a line growing upwards, my business is doing bad. If it's going downwards, my business is not doing good. It's leaders, that's what they say. They don't want to look thousand numbers in the spreadsheet. So what is the benefits? So the humans, they tend to like or interpret this visual representation better. So that means I can, with the help of this graphical representation, I can lead to a conclusion or make the decision faster. The visualization tools also helps to integrate the data across different data sources and different data sets, actually. Sometimes we got a requirement that, hey, I need a single pane of glass for my business. So basically, which means I can collect the data from different data sheets and different data sources and provide a one glance view for my leadership or for, for my stakeholders to make better decisions. <coughs> Logging is a way to track events when your software is running. It's nothing, it's just a fancy way of saying is, write everything, whatever software is doing. So you can have different types of logging. You can have a, have a logging where you record everything or log everything, or you can record if you're getting an error, or you can record the crucial operations what your user is performing. So, <clears throat> but whatever it is, you should log because logging is very important when the issue happens in your environments. Logging is the way you should be, will be able to track what the, what the issue error is facing, and with the help of log and track traces, you will be able to pinpoint the issue. Without logging, like having that troubleshooting or triaging becomes a nightmare. Again, some of the benefits are, logging is the most inexpensive way of managing and troubleshooting the IT applications. I will tell you, that's the most inspection way of doing that. Sometimes you have compliance and regulatory reasons like HIPAA and PCI <coughs> where you need, to, you need to log because my government is mandating that or my compliance reasons are mandating that. Logging is again an inexpensive way of doing that. Sometimes people use the logging data to get the business analytics, for example, the revenues for per hour or transaction data. You would have seen people creating dashboards out of Splunk actually. So that's nothing but business analytics only. We talked about alerting. Alerting is an automated message or a notification sent to an all, all call engineer to tell that, hey, something has happened on your software or hardware and it needs an action. So the alerting tool collects the alerts across your monitoring system, provides a single view, and then raises or sends a notification, sorry. <coughs> and sends a notification to the all kind engineer according to their preferred communication channel. So some of the benefits are the timeliness. So there are many things happening on your software and hardware because they're running all the time. So it's important that if something happens, if some error happens, 
then the on-call engineer is notified at the right time, so he can take appropriate action. Not only that, it's very important that the right person or the right team gets this notification so that he or she can take appropriate actions. Some tool uh, also actually helps up in setting up a Zoom line so that you can involve other teams and then that speed up your resolution time. And then not everyone wants to get paged by a phone or by text so the developers can choose their own preferred communication channel in editing. <coughs> Distributed tracing, this is what we also use New Relic for. So you have open source tools, you have microservices, you have cloud computing. All of these things have made our applications very distributed, and that's why distributed tracing is crucial. But what is distributed tracing? Distributed tracing is a technique for tracing the request as it flows from one layer to other, from front end to back end, back end to microservices, and microservices to database. So what is the benefit? It's pretty clear. So you can trace the request, and you can pinpoint the layer which the request is failing or you have issues, and then the, the developer can fix the issues because now you have identified the layer which is causing the problem. So if you are actually, if you have heard the terms MTDR and MTTD, which is mean time to detect and mean time to resolve, if you are actually measuring that, distributed tracing is very helpful because it helps us to detect the problem faster, it helps us to resolve the problem faster. Some of the user actions like how much time I take to purchase an item, you can find out using this distributed tracing. <coughs> SLAs, service level agreements, are the promises you make to your internal teams or the external customers. So with the help of distributed tracing tools, you can identify whether you are adhering to SLAs or not. And then you have different implementation, different microservices implementation, but you can integrate all these microservices implementation, but they are arriving in Java, Go, or Node, because these distributed tracing tools, they support a wide variety of applications and programming languages. So this is what we did for last six or seven years. I wrapped it up in like 40, 45 minutes, my entire journey of moving from monolithic to microservices to this modern architecture, and then there was no monitoring and no observability coming up with tools like Splunk and Neuralink to create a fully observable solution for our dealerships. Thank you. I will, sorry, any questions? <laughs> I think we are on time, so we have like, I think 10 minutes. <laughs> Do you want an honest answer or a data-driven answer? <laughs> okay. So some of these things are my decision or our decision, depending on the LOBs. And some of the things are like, we are a part of the auto loan. Some of the things are driven by, hey, you have to use that, like something like that. Because for example, if you ask, would I use Kubernetes versus ECS? I can. It's my decision? No, because the whole enterprise is using ECS, actually. But what we identified was, uh, we, we were using like app dynamics before Neuralink. And when it comes to this Neuralink, I think they would have evolved by now, but this is like three or four years back. But they were not able to give me all those details, like pointing it to the exact JavaScript line of code, which I could do with a DLDs monitoring tool like Neuralink. So we diverted back, and then that time actually we were using our homegrown solution for distributed tracing. So now if, uh, if I could have a single solution for like my tracing and my realism monitoring, then I don't have to ask developers, hey, go and try to navigate across three different tools actually just to figure out the issue. But if you ask me, I could actually put logging inside Neuralink also. Like I don't want developers to like open three different URLs because some issues are occurred actually. And again, the other thing was some of the things, as I said, was like more company driven where I don't have a say, but yeah.
are using cloud today? Everything? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that somebody was asking actually, like, hey, can you make cloud agnostic? And I'm like, okay, I have just stepped into ACS, don't ask me that question. <laughs> That's very difficult to move, like making a cloud. So we are like totally coupled with S3 now, and it's pretty, it's not cloud agnostic, it's pretty AWS service. So to move out of that is like, takes, takes a lot of time <laughs> for me. If you have any questions, then thank you for joining and thanks for listening to me.